blessed. Amen? Well, God's a good God, isn't he? He really is. Today I want to talk about a subject, if I could, and uh, it's about the Lord, and the title of it is, We Have a Secure Salvation. We have a secure salvation. It's amazing to me how many people, how they have trouble with their security. Uh, You talk with somebody, and they say, well, I got saved. I say, well, are you saved now? You know, you just want to know what they say. And uh, they say, well, I hope so, you know. And so a lot of people, uh, they come from different denominations, and they've been taught that you lose your salvation, and, you know, you have to keep so many works and things like that. So I want to talk just a little bit about that, if I could, today. Some doubt because if one can choose to be saved, they believe, then one can choose to turn away from Christ. If they use their free will to get in Christ, they can use their free will to get out of Christ, is their thinking. Some people think they're saved until they sin again. And they always are walking in fear because if they sin, they lose it. (laughs) I heard uh, or read about and I heard about Dr. Ironside said said he met a man who said he had been saved 99 times. <laughs> that's true, 99 times. That's amazing, isn't it? And a pastor uh, told a drunk who supposedly got saved every Sunday. He said, now what I'm going to do, he says, this Sunday after you get saved, I think I'll just go on and shoot you so you'll be assured you'll be saved. <laughs> that might be a good idea with some people, amen? And so... Uh, people have a real problem with their security, though. Some people say, well, it's not every time you sin that you lose your salvation, but it's when you commit willful sins, certain sins. And I'm saying, what sin are you talking about? Give me a list of your sin that you're talking about. Of course, they don't have that list. Some, they say, if you apostatize, you turn your back on the faith, you turn your back on Christ, you'll be lost. And all these are conditional security people. And their views that they hold, there's no line of standard that's clear. And as you listen to them, it's almost like salvation is by works. You have to do something to keep it. And Romans 11.6 says this right here. Romans 11.6, And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be a works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. In other words, what he's saying there, it either has to be one or the other. You can't mix them. It's either works or it's either grace. And we know we can't, there's none that doeth good. There's none that worketh right. You know, so if you're going to trust works, you're going to hell. (laughs) So you have to trust grace. I mean, it's just really simple. It's either grace or it's either works. And when people put conditions on your salvation, what they're doing is they're saying the cross only made a down payment for our salvation. And then we must keep up with their standards to maintain our salvation. And of course, that's crazy. I believe it's a complete denial of the finished work of Christ when you have to trust yourself also plus that. Amen? You're, you're staining the reputation of what God said he accomplished through his blessed son. And we don't want to do that. Some people say, well, no enemy can take us out of God's hand, but we are able of ourselves to remove ourselves from the hand of God through disobedience. Then others say, well, salvation is irrevocable. If one departs or won't live holy, that is evidence they were never saved. That's what they say. Some say, well, when you ask them if they're saved, they're going to heaven, they say, well, I think so, or I hope so. And when you have just I hope so, I think so salvation, uh, you're going to not have a whole lot of peace. You're going to be emotionally down quite often, and you're not going to grow a whole lot, that's for sure. Some think that just... uh, uh, because of their worry that removes security of the believer. They're chronic worriers, complainers. You ever been around somebody like that? 
constantly, chronically worrying, doubting. So they say their doubt is in the doubt of God's word by their worrying about it. They would rather doubt God's worry than doubt their own doubt about God. It's crazy, okay? And uh, then some people say, well, you lose assurance when you have these trials or stresses that come into your life. And they, their reasoning is because, you know, we're a child of God. Uh, we're supposed to be blessed by God. And so if these trials and these difficulties are coming into our life, evidently we're not one of his. And it just continues on to lead to confusion, doesn't it? Some people have doubt because of bad Bible teaching. They've been under teaching that's false. That's not according to biblical truth. And so as a result of that, they think that, you know, they're not sure if they're saved or not, or they can lose their salvation, and on and on it goes. A lot of people have a wrong understanding about the gospel of grace and as a result of that, that plays havoc with their confidence in the power and promises of God. Romans 16, 17 says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. And there's a lot of false trash out there. Rather than, thus saith the Lord, the word of God says it right here. Galatians 1, 6, and 7 says this here. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And you know, when you, you're saved by grace and then you think you have to do something to keep that salvation, you're leaving the gospel of grace to another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And there's a lot of perversions out there. And then it states in Ephesians 4.14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. There are many people, they've been hoodwinked. They've been misled by two systems within the church itself that has undermined their assurance of their salvation. The first system is this here. He loves me, he loves me not teachings. In other words, they teach they're saved today, but lost tomorrow. And to them, one's assurance is only as good as their present level of obedient living. In other words, as long as I maintain a certain level of living, I know I have it. But if I drop below that level, I must not have it now. The second system is this here. Their focus is on the importance of good works as proof of salvation. They say only if one perseveres to the end does he have assurance he or she is saved. And if you have that mentality, the truth about that is you will never know for sure until you get to heaven if you get there. I'm going around saying, golly, what if I don't persevere? What if something have, might have a bad day or something like that? And to live in that turmoil within your mind and your soul has to be awful. Let me just give you some Bible truth for believers. Believers who are guaranteed heaven. And these believers who are guaranteed heaven, they may live a life that honors Christ. Or they may not live a life that honors Christ. They might be believers, but they're carnal. They might even at times live like a lost person. Hello? First, Second Timothy chapter 2, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 
But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor unto, uh, unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. There are some people that are saved in the house of faith. They're saved, and there are some who, when it's all said and done, when they stand for God, they're vessels of honor. They've lived for God. They've tried to serve God the best. But also there are those that are saved, but they didn't give their all for Christ. And they will be vessels of dishonor, but still saved. That's the key, okay? They're still saved. Yes, no doubt about it, there's inconsistency within Christianity. We talk grace, but we're not always gracious. We speak holiness, but we don't always separate to God and his will, his word. We talk about Christ, but we live in our actions after Adam. Huh? And no doubt it's sad at times that we do fail the Lord. I think a classic example are the Corinthians. They did all kinds of things. I'll show you in just a second, but they were still saved. And that's what I want you to get hold of this morning. The problem is this here. Worldly living is easier than Christian living. Did you hear me? Worldly living is easier than Christian living. It's a lot easier to be fleshy, to sin, to walk in our old nature, to compromise so we won't lose our social life. Or we're afraid we might be called odd. As believers, at times we lie, we cheat, use foul language, feel, feel prideful, we lust, we quench the spirit, and even sometimes we find ourselves in the gutter. The Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, when we got saved, he's placed inside of us. He desires to work in us, and he does work, but he will not be forced by us. It's only when we're yielding and surrendered can he really work in our life. And I think that's so important. So... The believer who wants to go on and live in his own will and his own strength, the Spirit of God says, go on. He won't force it on us. I mean, he just doesn't do that. And they're still Christians. However, when you're a Christian and you decide, no, I'm not going to live for God. I'm going to live the way I want to now. I know I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to live like I want to right now. When you do that, you will... Reap what you sow. That's just part of life. And I've noticed that believers, and in my own life, when I'm trying to live for Christ as a young believer and trying to come up and so on, you'll be miserable when you're not living for God if you're saved. You'll be convicted. You'll have little joy, no power. Your growth will be hindered. You'll have a terrible testimony. <laughs> You'll be convicted about going contrary to God's ways. You might even have an early death. Because of your biblical ignorance, you'll never have assurance. With your no godly living, being ineffective. And think about that. And you have a future date to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Not to determine your salvation, that's settled, but to determine the rewards that you will have throughout all eternity. And he says the bad thing is going to be burned up. I think there's going to be a lot of Christians going to be smoking one day. I hope I'm not one. I don't want to be. How about you? 
But we have to stand for him. And if we've not lived for him, we'll stand before him in utter shame. Now we know God wants us to live godly and Christ-like. And when I'm saying a person that has done some things, I'm not saying license to sin. Romans 6, 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Now I'm going to come back to that in just a second, fellas. We're not talking about license. You can do whatever you want. Now you can do whatever you want, but that's not what God wants from you. Grace teaches us to live for Christ. Grace teaches us to get in the word, study it, apply it to our lives, to pray, to attend God's house, to fellowship with other believers so we can be encouraged. But as individuals, we are free to choose. We can choose godly living, or we can choose sinful living. That choice is yours, and that choice is mine. You know, under the law, it was do good or you'll be punished. Right? That's not today under the dispensation of grace. That verse they showed a while ago, Romans six fourteen, guys. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? What does he say? God forbid. The classic example, again, is the Corinthians. Now, you just think about some of the things they were doing. It was unbelievable. The father had a son who was having sex with his new wife, his stepmom. They sued one another. They fought each other. They were carnal. They were babes in the faith. They questioned God's wisdom. They were spiritually immature. They act selfishly, devilish. Yet they were saved. Is that a shock? (laughs) Are we sure about that? Well, I know this. Paul called them brethren. Paul said, you're saints to them. Paul says, we, he identified with, we who are believers, that's what he was saying. They were saved. And remember, we're not saved by performance, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. He alone paid the price for all our sin, past, present, future sin. Understand, the assurance of salvation is not based upon our feelings in the things we do or the things we avoid. (laughs) So what should we base our assurance upon if not our works, if not our feelings, if not our behavior? And it's simple. Our assurance is found in Christ. Did you hear that? Our assurance is found in Christ. We don't look to Christ for salvation and then look elsewhere for the certainty and the assurance of that salvation. Christ says, when I saved you, I said I saved you for all eternity. John 10, 27 says this, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. That's really important right there. He states this, 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You know, God wants you to know that you have security. He wants you to know that you have eternal life. The moment you put your faith in the gospel, you're saved. 
and salvation and assurance of salvation are woven together. The gospel is assurance. Notice this day's 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, you believe, received, and wherein you stand. For I delivered unto you first of all, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, does he add anything else beside that gospel? There's nothing else that can save you except that gospel. Not you going to church, not you giving your money, not your water baptism, not your trying to live at a certain level. That has nothing to do with you being saved. It's your faith alone in the gospel alone. That's the only thing. That's our assurance. Being saved and eternal life are one and the same. He says, I give you eternal life. Now, if it were to stop along the way, it wouldn't be eternal, would it? Amen? And so, being saved includes assurance. And these two cannot be separated. The God who saves us through his Son is the same God who promises us to secure us. Now, it states in Colossians 2.6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, how did you receive him? By faith, okay? As you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. Paul says, just as you receive Christ by faith alone in him as your Savior, use that same principle. Find your assurance of faith in him and his work alone for your salvation, and for your assurance. The reason I know I'm saved, I deserve it? No. <laughs> no, no, I deserve to go straight to hell. So do you. But I look at what he's done, and I believe that's enough. That's my assurance. That's the only thing that matters in my assurance. It's that. If I'm adding anything else, it ceases to be grace and it becomes a mixture of grace plus works. And he says, no, I'm not going to give man any of my glory. I'm the only one who deserves the glory. I'm the one who died for you, was buried and rose again. Just believe what I did, who I am, what I did, that's enough. And stop adding all this other stuff. Amen? I wrote this down, man's free will is not greater than God's will or purpose. Amen? The unfaithfulness of man cannot frustrate the promises of God. Titus 1, 2, he says this, In hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. He promises to give you eternal life the moment you believe. He states in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. What I started in you, it will be completed in you. I gave you eternal life at the beginning, and you're going to have eternal life in the end. He's the author of our faith, but also he's the finisher of our faith. Amen? 2 Timothy 1, 12. For the which cause I suffer uh, these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know who I, whom I have believed and, and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Last part of Ephesians 1, 6. It states there, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The reason we have always eternal, always acceptance with God is because we're in Christ. Not anything we do or don't do, it's because we believed in the gospel and that placed us in Christ. I'm in him now. And when God sees me, he doesn't see my terrible actions at times. All he sees is the righteousness, righteousness of Christ that he has placed me in. Amen? That's why I have assurance. That's why I know I'm going to heaven one day. Not to be arrogant, not to be prideful, 
but to be grateful, to be humbled. Why? Why somebody like me? Amen? And then he states in Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Christ is the first one who came from the grave and glorified bodies. And we're going to follow him. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. When God saved you in his mind, in his purpose, in his will for your life, not only did he save you, he justified you, but he's already determined you're glorified. You're already glorified. Mind the purpose, the plan of God. Now think that through. What shall we then say to these things? Glory! Amen, okay? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us. Amen? Hey, we're a sealed deal. Huh? Huh? I might falter sometimes, but I'm sealed. I might not always please God, but I'm sealed. Hmm? Ephesians 1, 13, 14. In whom ye also trusted after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, us, unto the praise of his glory. When saved, we're given the Holy Spirit, which is pledged by God. It's a down payment by God with more to come. He's the earnest. He's the down payment. The Spirit of God is of what's going to come. And he's sealed in us until the day of redemption. And no man, no what man can do, can break that seal. As a little boy came out of church when the preacher preached on eternal security, he said to the preacher, we're sitting pretty good, aren't we? <laughs> Amen? And we are. We are. Somebody said this, we've been given a drop as proof that we shall someday have the ocean. Amen? Believers are guaranteed to arrive in heaven one day. Romans 8, 9 says this, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his, verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. It's an amazing thing. Even when you fail, the spirit of God is still there tugging at your heart and he's witnessing with you. Do you understand you're a child of God? You shouldn't be doing this. Amen? 2 Timothy 2.13, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Even when we're not in the best of behavior, he can't deny the promise that he made to us. I save you for all eternity. God has not forgotten us. He still and always will love us all the way to and through glory. I've given this illustration before, but it's good. It fits here. I remember reading about people falling and dying while working, painting the Golden Gate Bridge. So what they did, they made a large net and they placed it under all the painters. And from that time on, hardly anybody ever fell, fall from that point on because underneath them, they had assurance of a safety net. 
And as a child of God, our assurance is our safety net. And I want you to know we're still safe even when we fall because he catches us and puts us back on course. And once again, I'm saved for all eternity, regardless of what I do. It's not dependent upon what I do. It's dependent upon the fact that I believed in him and that gospel, what he did for me. But that does not give me license. That's not what grace is about. You know the verse as well, Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, this grace teaching us, grace teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That's what grace does. Grace works in us, not like a hammer beating us, but working inside of us, helping us to love Christ more. Thus, I want to please Christ more. Thus, I live for Christ more. Huh? And grace works that in us. The reason I want to work the reason I want to do God's will is because this grace has worked in me. I'm so grateful of what he's done for me, undeserving, but he did it for me. And out of that heart of, of being appreciative, of a heart of love for what he's done for me, I said, God, what can I do? He says, Jim, I want you to live a good Christian life. I want you to live holy, and I want you to be a testimony for me. I don't want you to be tied up and look just like lost people. Now, I know a lot of my people do that, but I'm not pleased with that. So I want you to be a vessel of honor for me. And he works in us, and we surrender our will to his will. And we find his will right here in the word of God. Amen? Now, the great thing, uh, I, I, like the, I just like it. In Genesis 1, it says, God, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that wasn't his first thing he did, you see, because God is a God of order and structure. He's an organized God. <laughs> and so what he did, he thought about what he was going to do first. He said, I'm going to do this on the first day. I'm going to do this on the second day. I'm going to do this. And he purposed and he planned it. Then he backed up. And he started it. Okay? It wasn't just off the hat. Likewise, sending his son to come and die for our sins, it wasn't just an afterthought. It was before the foundation of the world, as a matter of fact, that they had the council and the Godhead, and they said, here's how we're going to do this. We're going to do it this way. We're going to do it this way. He's going to die on a cross. Israel's going to reject him but then I'm going to raise up a new apostle, Paul, and he's going to share the truth of this gospel that can save one for all eternity. He said, this is our purpose, this is our plan. Son, you go and you die for the world. Spirit, you go down and you live in them so they can live for us and get this message out. He planned it, purposed it, then he came back and he started. Hmm? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God and the, what? And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The process began. And so I'm saying this to you today. The fact that you got saved is not by an accident. You see, don't miss this. If God has called you to be saved. He would not have called you if he had not already finished you. Amen? Amen. Huh? 
Isn't that amazing? So we're sitting pretty good. Amen? I don't know about you. I'm thankful that I have security in Christ. And I'm not worried about it, but I do want to please God with my life now out of gratitude. Old time preacher wrote this little poem. He said this, In Christ believers rest secure, judgment past and heaven sure. No wrath to come but blessed peace, life in Christ shall never cease. Saved by grace, not what we do, by faith in Christ, we're creatures new. Complete in Christ and with him one, in heaven seated with God's own son. He brought with him the reign of grace. In death he took the sinner's place. God spared him not, but from above. He sent to earth his son of love. Made of a woman, God's own child, was holy, harmless, undefiled. He knew no sin, but on the tree he was made sin for you and me. His precious blood for us was shed. In the tomb, Christ three days dead. Death abolished an empty grave. By this gospel, God can save. Amen. It's all of grace. And when you come to faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, put your faith, be assured, you're going to make it there. Now, how you make it there is determined by how you live your life. I don't want to stand before him one day and be there in utter shame. A lot of people say, boy, I just can't wait to see Jesus. Your first thought is, I'd be a little worried if I were you. But anyway, <laughs> but then I said, I have to worry myself. Not concerning my salvation. And not even concerning the rewards. Just concerned that I want to please him. And I let him down. And I don't want to do that. How about you? Uh, and it's this grace that does work in us so that we can be vessels of honor for him. Father, we love you. Thank you for the fact that when you save us, you save us. Not just a momentary emotional high experience, but an eternal relationship with you that is unbroken, cannot be changed, will happen for all eternity. And that's all because your son, Jesus Christ, died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And that satisfied your justice against man's sins. That satisfied what you believe was necessary to pay the total full debt of sin by the sacrifice of your only begotten son. And for that, we're eternally grateful. For that, we say, God, I love you. Where I failed you, I'm sorry for that. But God, by your grace, I'm picking up the pieces, I'm wiping the dust off, and I'm going to get back so that when I stand before you one day, you'll be proud of me. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? We hope that you received a blessing from today's broadcast. We would love to have you to visit us in person Sunday at 10 a.m. in New Whiteland. You can watch us live and view past services on our website at gpnd.net. For more information, please visit our website or contact us by phone. Until next week, may God richly bless you is our prayer.